Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christina Ramirez, and I'm your host today at the surrogate session. In recognition of November as National Alzheimer's Disease Awareness and Family Caregivers Month. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. All participants are muted, but you have the ability to ask questions throughout the program by typing them in. You should see on the bottom side of your screen a Q&A section. You can type in your questions and I will see them. And after the presentation is given, um, we're going to go through as many questions um, and the panelists will give answers as appropriate. Also, a recording of today's session will be made available on the surrogates website at a later date. It'll probably be sometime early next week. And that is at MarsSurrogate.com. Now I'd like to introduce to you our panel. Today, Heather Darling, she is um, she is our surrogate and she's an attorney and former Morris County freeholder. Um, surrogate Darling was elected and took office as the surrogate in January of 2020. The surrogate has as our guest today, Robin Cohn. Robin is the Director of Programs and Services of the Alzheimer's Association, Greater New Jersey Chapter, which is also referred to as AAGNJ. As a reminder, please use your Q&A box to send in your questions, and I will now turn the program over to our surrogate, Heather Darling and Ms. Cohn. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christina. Uh, I, I want to welcome the audience today. Robin, welcome to you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you um, very much, surrogate. You're absolutely welcome. And uh, this surrogate session for, for the audience and for Robin as well is part of an ongoing series that we're having. And what we're trying to do is educate people about this office and how we act as a resource for the people in times that you're uh, very much in needs, usually at the most difficult times in people's lives. So we want this experience to be something that's easier for you. And we think that education is one way that can happen. With regard to today's subject, um, the office does not act as a resource for Alzheimer's. However, our office serves as the gateway to guardianships for individuals. And knowing that Robin and her team do act as resources for the people, early on in my, in my um, term in office, within the first few months, we had partnered with Robin and her organization because before I became the surrogate, we entered into discussions um, to bring awareness to this devastating disease after I attended an Alzheimer's walk at a local, it was a local um, lake. And I was really moved by how many people were there, the conversations that were going on, and specifically a woman my own age that was suffering from early onset of the disease. When I looked out at the crowd, I saw that Alzheimer's is not a disease that discriminates. And um, Robin, I think you and I talked the other day about how overwhelmed I was when I looked at this field and, and an entire field was, was just dotted with different colors and each color represented somebody who was either a sufferer or a caregiver or a family member or someone with Alzheimer's and each was holding up a different colored flower to show their role in what this is about, whether they were there to support someone and, and walk to help raise funds. So um, again, the, this office um, serves to help people with guardianships, to help people get into guardianships, protect them. Um, we'll get into that later on in the session. But really, Robin's office serves more as a resource. So, so what I'd like to accomplish today is to have a dialogue about this disease and use it as a platform to support those that are afflicted, especially caregivers, to discuss their needs. Because while they're caring for others, oftentimes their own selves are being taxed and they need care as, as much as the person that's suffering. So Robin, I'll turn it over to you. Surrogate, thank you so very much for welcoming the Greater New Jersey chapter of the National Alzheimer's Association. As you know, we have our office in Florham Park, which is, of course, part of Morris County, and we are a national organization. The organization is the largest healthcare organization nonprofit. 
that is powered by volunteers around the world. And certainly as we look at New Jersey and we know we have 190,000 people reported to have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or other dementia, and also knowing that we have close to 500,000 caregivers just in our state of New Jersey. So the Greater New Jersey chapter services our community, which certainly encompasses people living with Alzheimer's and dementia. It certainly encompasses caregivers, 500,000 of them. And certainly when we take a look at the families and we take a look also at our communities, we work harder every single day talking with our community members, educating, informing, providing certainly the care and the support that our families need. And currently there are more than 5.8 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. And over 15 million are serving as their caregivers. So just think about that for a moment of how many people are affected. And the Alzheimer's Association works to address the global Alzheimer's disease crisis by providing information, education, care and support to the millions of people who face dementia every single day while advancing critical research toward methods of treatment, better management, brain health, brain promotion, and ultimately a cure. November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month and November is also National Caregivers Awareness Month. So we want all of our caregivers and our families to know that we are here for them. What's most important for our viewers to know is that we have a free nationwide helpline available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that number is 800-272-3900. And what's most important is that when you call that number, whether it's two in the afternoon or certainly two in the morning, there will be someone that answers the phone. No technology is utilized for our families. Masters trained clinical specialists answer the phone and provide information, education, national resources, and local resources. And they will talk with families for as long as they need them, whether it's safety services, whether it's emotional and supportive listening. And that's what's really critical. And we do the exact same thing in our state of New Jersey. For the greater New Jersey chapter, we care for our families in 14 of our 21 counties. And certainly being national, we communicate and we certainly work with our families throughout the entire state of New Jersey. We host peer-to-peer -peer education programs, education webinars, that have been active from day one of the pandemic. We present programs daily, education webinars. We bring our families online and also by phone because we know that so many of our families have difficulty with technology and we educate them. And what's been very helpful during the pandemic is that our families have a place to go. They can call us, they can get the education, the information, and because we have so many virtual online education webinars, we have volunteers who left. We have staff that's online so that we have more of what you had mentioned, surrogate. Let's have a discussion. Let's have a conversation. Let us help our families when they need them. We also have virtual caregiver support groups. So we invite families every day to come online with the Alzheimer's Association right here at the Greater New Jersey chapter. And we provide counseling, emotional support, most importantly, resources. We have a repository of resources for families, for people living with Alzheimer's and dementia, because we are trained specialists. We talk with families every single day. We provide tips and tools and resources. And so we connect our families with also the resources that are available in our counties. For example, in Morris County, I've done many programs with the Board of Social Services. I certainly am in touch with the AAA. We talk to our respite program coordinators, our JAC 
program coordinators, and we connect all of our families with all of the health systems, as well as the programs and services that they need when they need them. And it's not about just connecting. We help our families to better understand what services can be provided where. And I know that surrogate, you'll be talking about that in terms of the offerings that you provide in your office. And we help families to better understand what that looks like. And we also prepare them for the questions that may help them just get to that next step. The more education that we have, the more information, the more resources, we feel more empowered. I can ask the questions I need to ask because what's worse than not knowing? So better understanding and also remember that our helpline has a translation service so we can speak in over 200 dialects. We also present virtual programming in many different languages. We have resources in many different languages as well. And certainly we have programs for all communities. Diversion and inclusion is a very important pillar for the Alzheimer's Association. So we deliver programs to families knowing, you know, our community as well as we know it. Um, I'm certainly, you know, um, I was born and raised in our state of New Jersey, very familiar with all of the counties that we service. And we reach out to all community partners to better understand their services. And what's important here today is that we wanna connect with our community partners. We wanna be able to do programming together. We wanna be able to motivate our community so that we can ultimately get a little bit closer to providing cure for Alzheimer's disease, hope certainly, and bring support that our families need. So we're right there with our families, holding their hand, and we've extended our hours during the pandemic so that our families know that we don't work, you know, nine to five. Of course, many, many of us always say that, of course not. But certainly during this time, we have programming in the evening, early morning, around the clock, because we know how important it is that people should not feel alone, especially during this particular time of, you know, being physically distanced. But uh, certainly if people are physically distanced, it doesn't mean they have to be socially distant, right? So it's a really nice and important opportunity for our families to know that they're not alone. And, you know, when you get a diagnosis, you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. So we're working so closely with our health systems and our healthcare providers so that they too know to call the Alzheimer's Association. Social supports, uh, certainly uh, our medical um, and healthcare, you know, communities really need to better understand what we provide. And I want everyone to know we're a resource. We are educators. We certainly can provide the social supports, the resources, the services that people need in our communities. And certainly, you know, knowing that we have education programs, peer-to-peer -peer counseling, we have support groups that um, we invite our caregivers to come online with us with our loved ones with Alzheimer's disease so that they too can see us, right? And that we can inform. We have memory cafes throughout the entire state of New Jersey where our families can come online with their loved ones and then we could engage them in brain health exercises and different types of activities. We have programs that involve the arts, dance, and um, all activities. During certainly Alzheimer's Awareness Month, we want people to know about the Alzheimer's Association, but then we also want our caregivers to know that we are well equipped to provide them with daily activities, the importance of keeping the schedule for their families, and certainly to be able to support them in ways that um, they may not, you know, be able to, uh, you know, attain, you know, from just traditional methods. So um, if people have needs, we fulfill those needs, right? So if people are looking for programming that um, involve young adult children or spouses or faith-based organizations or any type of ask that we receive, because certainly our helpline comes into the greater New Jersey queue. So surrogate every single day, I'm on helpline. 
I talk to families and if they want to talk for an hour and a half, I will talk with them for an hour and a half. It doesn't matter to me because that's what's the most important part of my job. And it's not a job. It's, it's just a life passion to be able to help others. Well, I think Robin, you know, that's key because the cost to caregivers and those suffering is often considered financially, but the emotional cost is often neglected. And I've been looking through as you were speaking some of some of the statistics um, that I have from your materials. And when I see 50% of the primary care physicians believe that the medical profession is not equipped to keep up with the growing number of people that are suffering from Alzheimer's, that we've had a 146% increase in Alzheimer's death since 2000. Uh, we've got 16 million Americans that are paying for uncovered Alzheimer's care. And as you said, in New Jersey alone, 500,000 people are caring for people who are afflicted with Alzheimer's. And 500,000 is roughly the entire population of Morris County. So if you spread that out around the state, that's, that's huge. You've got five, 510 million hours of Alzheimer's care each year that's unpaid. And if you looked at that and, and you put it in terms of what the value would be, that's actually $6.68 billion of, of unpaid care. You've got 1,460 emergency room visits per year per 1,000 patients with Alzheimer's disease, which means that there's repetitive hospital visits, hospitalizations, to the emergency room for these people that are suffering from Alzheimer's. Medicaid is paying about 2.18 billion a year for Alzheimer's. Medical care, Medicare costs are about 31 million, uh, 31,000 per year per patient. So, you know, you're really providing resources, but you're also working with these walks and other things that you're doing, these fundraisers, to help find a cure as well. So, so you're looking to, to give people resources to help them. You're looking to raise money to help with resources or research and also to help families with their resources. So really it's an incredible thing in, in my opinion, what you and the people at your organization that I've had the good fortune to get to know are doing for the people. And what's interesting, surrogate, is that our programs and services are a service to the community. They are free. So if you think about, you know, all of the costs that we just talked about and knowing that we provide free services, you know, that is a gift to a family. To be able to call the Alzheimer's Association and to be able to receive help care and support resources and giving them what they can't always be able to attain in the communities is really, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's life opening, it's life enriching, right? To be able to give just a little bit more to a family is so important because the cost of care is tremendous. And in today's economy, it, and it, and years ago, the economy was the same as well. I mean, you know, obviously our situations change all the time, but what's really important is that when we look at Alzheimer's and dementia, <clears throat> pardon me, we are looking at, you know, a situation where it's not just a medical issue. It's not just a social support issue. It's emotional, but it's also economic, right? And as we study um, social determinants of health, and we realize that you know many of our subpopulations are affected more, such as the black population, such as Latino population, such as women are affected more. And the more that we learn through research, we realize that there's so much that we really need to better understand. And when we promote health and um, education, we talk a lot about the importance of brain health and exercising our brain through not only physical exercise, we always talk about what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And of course, we always talk about the connection between um, cardiovascular health, cardiometabolic health and brain health. 
as well as eating well, eating healthfully. We have a lot of programming around healthy living for your brain and body, tips from the latest research, where we talk about um, different food choices and adapting healthier behaviors. We also talk about cognitive engagement, exercise your brain through reading, learning a new activity, learning new hobbies, for example, learning a new language. And um, all of this is really in the guise of prevention because prevention is very important. You know, today, as we sit here surrogate, we don't have a cure. We don't have a medication that's going to slow down the progression of the disease. We do not have a medication that is disease modifying. The medications that have been on market for many years help some people with signs and symptoms, but not everyone. And knowing that this is a progressive um, journey, knowing that if I were to be diagnosed today with mild cognitive impairment, I have a trajectory of perhaps 15, 18, 20 years. So what is that gonna look like for me, you know? And um, when you were mentioning surrogate in the very beginning about meeting a woman that isn't your typical, what we think about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, because there are 200,000 people that are living with Alzheimer's and dementia with a diagnosis in their 50s. So you can imagine the family support that they need, the fact that no longer are they able to keep a full-time job. So what does that look like for them? How do they talk to their work colleagues, their employers? There's a lot of stigma that's associated and even more stigma when you're 50 years old and 60 years old because you know your plan about working over the course of the next maybe 15 years, right? Is, is really, it's just, it's gone. You don't have that anymore. So what happens when you have a family? What happens to your kids that are in college, right? So there's so many areas that we have to look at. And when we look at Alzheimer's and dementia in our communities, we're not talking about people in their elder years always, or very elderly, or you know, um, our populations that are lucky enough to live to 100 years of age. You know, you back that up and you see that 50 year olds, 55 year olds, we have people in our community. That's why virtual memory cafes are so important because I have a grouping of individuals that we talk to all the time, men, women that are in their 50s and I mean, not able to keep a position. You mentioned dementia. I want to circle back to that in a second, but you also uh, spoke for a minute there on exercise, which I yes. think you know, as, as somebody who's been a fitness enthusiast, that stands out in my mind because in today's society, we're not out working in the fields anymore. We're sitting behind desks for the most part. Even mechanics stop turning wrenches in large part or do doing diagnosis and, and fixing cars by use of a computer that they plug in. And I'm not saying they're not out there working hard and turning wrenches, they still are, but a large part of their, even their jobs, where you're talking about somebody that used to be moving around all day has become standing still. And I think it's it's interesting that you have chosen walks, right? Which we know there are, there are walks for various afflictions to raise awareness, but walks, of course, stimulate blood flow to the brain, which to exactly. my mind, the greater the blood flow to the brain, uh, the better it is for us. And, and we need to balance the fact that we sit all day with some form of physical activity that does do that. Because I, I think that that plays a large role in what happens later on in life. Just, just as you said, the cognitive exercise for the brain, you need the physical. But getting back to what you indicated with dementia, there are other diseases that are mixed in with Alzheimer's um, and, and other families that may have the same needs. Specifically, I'm talking about dementia, psychosis, Parkinson's, and even depression. Um, can you tell me whether and how your organization supports those families? Absolutely. The Alzheimer's Association supports not only Alzheimer's, but all other dementia. 
And we like to think of dementia as being a very large category, a very large umbrella, for example, of presentations of signs and symptoms and syndromes and Alzheimer's disease is a prominent form of a dementia related disorder, but there are many different types of dementia. They have interplay with one another. They share some common signs and symptoms and different types of expressions. For example, we have vascular dementia. People may have, you know, experienced with their loved one a uh, incident or a series of incidences with um, a stroke or mini strokes. And that um, vascular dementia is a really a comorbidity, a concomitant condition from having lost the blood flow to the brain. So someone may have a dementia called vascular dementia. There's also dementia with Lewy bodies that just present a little bit differently with a you know, buildup of, of that particular protein. Uh, frontotemporal lobar degeneration in the front part of our brain near the hippocampus. So that is more associated with speech and communication. So when we talk about cognitive exercises, what we're trying to do is keep, keep that hippocampus open, that, you know, that front part of our brain that is really responsible for short-term memory. Right, so it's very important when we talk about physical exercise that we talk to families all the time about walking and walking very safely, right, in our communities, but walking. And certainly um, Alzheimer's being the most prominent form of a dementia related disorder, we can't dismiss other conditions such as Parkinson's disease, right? where someone with Parkinson's disease may start to also have a concomitant condition such as a dementia-related disorder, where you know, someone may uh, certainly be affected by speech or memory loss, as well as different types of mobility issues. Because remember that the brain is a center of our, our entire existence, right? It, it, um, it helps me to speak right now, right? Move my arms, move my legs, move my head. And certainly, you know, being the control center of our body and knowing that unfortunately with Alzheimer's and all other dementia, that our brain um, shrinks. So it's only about three pounds to begin with. So if it shrinks to half of its size, it, it, it may affect other parts of our brain, such as hearing, for example which is why we always talk to families that if, you know, someone is experiencing, you know, some of the signs or symptoms of memory loss that perhaps they check their hearing, right? Because if you can't hear, you're not able to communicate as well as vision and some of the other areas such as mobility. So there are so, so many ways to learn more. Robin, now now that we're coming up on the on the 30 minute mark and you've sort of brought us to that before we get to the Q and A's um, we're talking we're talking now about some of the ways that somebody might be impacted some of the ways that somebody might have deficits, which is a nice dovetail into where my office fits into this. Um, so for a, a minor, a guardian would be appointed through the surrogates court, however. For somebody who's suffering from Alzheimer's that tends to be now you've indicated in even 50s and 40s, but they're they're not a minor, uh, they would be appointed as a result of a medical necessity through the superior court with the processing going through my office. So, you know, it's very interesting because guardianships used to be all encompassing. And all encompassing meant your financial affairs, your medical affairs, everything. But now, as you've indicated, depending on the progression, it may only relate to certain aspects of a person's life that they have the deficiencies. So guardianships now are really tailored. Doctors have to come in and say, this is where the person needs to have a guardian appointed. So it may be for medical care that they would eschew because they don't want to acknowledge the disease or um, they, they just don't want to address it, hoping that somehow it'll go away because bad news, if we go to the doctor, we might get bad news, but no news is good news kind of belief that sometimes can be very dangerous. 
or perhaps the person is on um, writing checks and, and giving money away to unscrupulous individuals, and that's an issue. So a lot of people now are trying to go with powers of attorney, which is a choice that you can make as long as you're helping someone with their affairs. And you're going and, and maybe helping them with some banking and making life easier for them because of, of any issue, mobility, something else that they may be having that they just can't get around and out and about and do what they would normally do. Maybe they're not driving, something like that. But um, if you have a power of attorney, of course, especially with, with financial matters, the person who's afflicted can still handle their own affairs as well as the person that has the power over their affairs. With the guardianship, the individual no longer has powers over the affairs where the court appoints a guardian, which means that if you wrote a check for some amount to an unscrupulous individual and the bank saw your signature on the check, then the, it would be incumbent on the bank not to cash that check with your signature on it because the guardian would actually have the control of that account and that information would be provided by the guardian presumably to the bank and that would serve to protect the individual from themselves and you know people people that come to my office that seek guardianships for somebody sometimes it can be difficult because the person over whom the guardianship is being sought does not necessarily want somebody to be the guardian of their own affairs. And then it comes down to really the, the physicians come more into play because the question is, should they or shouldn't they? In other cases, you may have a sibling or two siblings that both want to take care of mom or dad and who is best equipped to serve. So mom or dad, every, everyone agrees, including mom or dad, that they need this guardianship no one's contesting it, but everyone's contesting who's the best person for the job. And then, of course, you have the case where it's very simple and everybody says, well, there's definitely something wrong with mom or dad. Mom or dad acknowledges this. They went to the doctors. They want a certain sibling, a certain person to be the guardian. Everybody in the family agrees that that's the best choice. But now all of a sudden, this person is the guardian and they find themselves dealing with two kids that they're shuttling to two different sports at the same time, five days a week, and taking care of mom or dad and their needs. And that, I think, brings us back around to where your organization steps in. Because once we go through everything that's required with a family to get the guardianship in place, your organization is there to be able to provide not just the afflicted individual, but the family member with the resources and even the ability to say, hey, look, here's a place, here's, a, here's an adult daycare, here's a resource so that you can go to work and you can do the things that you need to do. And mom and dad are in a good facility during the day and they're actually getting some memory care and they're getting some assistance. and. It's it's almost better for them to go out and have some interaction than for them to be home. So that being said, with regard to my office, um, Rob and I would typically turn it over now to Christina to present the audience questions. As you and I discussed the other day, I am going to do that. But the audience questions where I would normally step in and field about 50 percent of them, I'm going to give 100 percent to you unless they're specifically in reference to guardianships through my office, because in reality, you are in fact the expert and this, this session is dedicated to Alzheimer's awareness. And we have partnered with you specifically for that purpose previously and, and for today's purposes. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you and Christina and I, I may jump in from time to time, but the show is yours for now. Thank you so very much. Okay, thank you. That was really very, very informative. And we do have a number of questions here. Um, the first one I think is, um, I'm gonna you give this question to you first, Robin, because it's really what's on many, many people's minds. Why is this disease growing among so many? That's a very complicated question. And I don't know if we have all of the answers. What we do know is that people are more aware 
the more information, the more education that people have available to them, the more opportunities that they have to ask the questions that they need to ask. And being aware of the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease and seeing that um, they are, you know, experiencing, you know, differences, you know, is very important for everyone to better understand. I think also, you know, when we take a look at information and education, that's important. But then also people are living longer today, right? You know, years ago, people used to live in their 70s, maybe a little bit into their 80s, but now people are living longer. And by living longer, you know, some people are feeling not only, you know, um, the, uh, I would say the result of, of, of healthy, you know, living, but they're also feeling the, um, perhaps the social as well as the cognitive effects of the changes that we see as we grow older. We want everyone to live well. We have many programs that talk about living well with Alzheimer's disease, but I think that um, everyone knowing a little bit more has enabled people to be able to seek that diagnosis from their primary care physician, to get a referral to a neurologist, to know that they need to seek services in our communities as well. Well, just to add on to that, a follow-up question. Actually, there are a couple of follow-up questions to that. So you mentioned going to a neurologist. Do you think people just go to doctors more and there's more diagnoses now? I think that people are aware of the importance of prevention. I think that people are aware that um, Medicare ha now has available, you know, during the wellness check, the yearly, you know, annual examination. We have been on asking our families to be able to seek, you know, that conversation with their healthcare providers. And our healthcare providers are now asking cognitive questions amongst the questions that are usually, you know, presented to all of us during, you know, our annual medical history review. What's important is that people are more aware. They're more aware because they're working longer, they're more aware because families and friends, and usually they're the see the signs and symptoms of an individual where, you know, perhaps they're just, you know, having more and more difficulty, whether it be carrying on a conversation, whether it's memory loss that is disruptive in our daily living, issues such as wandering, issues such as um, executive function and navigation. So people being aware of the signs and symptoms are, um, you know, providing um, themselves and their family with the opportunity to start to talk about it. Although there's a lot of stigma associated okay. as well. So you had mentioned earlier about hearing. Is hearing or lack of hearing a sign of Alzheimer's or dementia? It can be uh, a sign because, of course, you know, that is part of, you know, the mechanism of our, of our brain. But what's important here is that if people cannot hear, then they cannot communicate well. So we always want to make sure that not only do we have our eyes checked every single year, but we also have our hearing checked. Because if people are, you know, um, in a situation where they're not able to hear, then they can't communicate, then they start to really um, atrophy because they, they can't um, engage as much as, you know, um, they used to. So we have to just take a look at every, you know, aspect of why a person is having difficulty with communications or speech, for example. Okay, here's another question for you. What, what is the first thing I should do when my loved one is diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Call the Alzheimer's Association. And I say that because what's important here is that I want all of our families to know the information and the resources that we have available. As the surrogate was mentioning, there are resources in our community to help families. We have a community resource finder portal. That portal, not only is it available in our state of New Jersey, but it's certainly available throughout the entire country. And that provides resources, programs, and services. So if a family is looking for home care support, 
home health care support, a listing of neurologists, for example, geriatricians, geriatric practitioners, elder lawyers, right? Financial advisors. It's very important if they call first 800-272-3900, we will help a family take that next step. If I were diagnosed today, I would need to know what do I do next? I don't wanna be in a situation where I'm not informed, I'm not educated. I wanna know what's ahead of me. I want to have a plan in place and early care planning is so important for families. We help a family navigate through their journey, wherever their journey places them, from start to finish. Okay, and that there's a number of questions that kind of gets to this um, about taking care of your loved one. Should my loved one be at home with me? Should they be in a facility? Um, how do I manage at home? Is that the right thing for them? Is it the right thing for our family? Can you speak to that? There's like several questions on this front. Absolutely. And it's very individual. Uh, when you see or meet a person with Alzheimer's disease, you've met one person. And I think that that's really important. Person-centered approaches are critically important. What my family may need may not be the same as other family members. It depends upon where they are on the journey. Are they certainly more in their earlier stages? Families are living with Alzheimer's uh, disease for many years before it becomes a tipping point. And that tipping point may be all around safety. If someone is not safe in your home, if they're not safe in their home, then that is a time where we have to look at other options, right? Safety is our number one priority with our families, whether it be in the home or certainly outside of the home. You know, over 65% of people living with Alzheimer's may wander. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they're wandering aimlessly. That means, according to them, they're just living in another time period. So they may want to go to work, right? Because for years, perhaps, you know, they're a teacher and they want to be able to obviously be productive. This is their life, they're a teacher and they want to be able to go to school to teach. So they may decide that, you know, today's the day that I have to go to work. And so um, they may want to um, just, you know, obviously take that journey. And what's very interesting to us is that we work with all um, of our sheriff's departments, our, our police academies, so that they better understand Alzheimer's and dementia, how to approach a person, how to manage that individual. There's Project Lifesaver in every single county of our state. And what's important is that we want families to know what safety services are available and how they can get the help when they need them. So it's always that tipping point. And that tipping point could be daily activities, needing more assistance, ADLs, more assistance with daily activity, such as bathing, such as grooming, such as, you know, certainly eating. A lot of people with Alzheimer's have a lot of difficulty remembering to eat. So they don't eat or they don't drink. They become dehydrated, right? You know, the more that a person progresses through their own journey, the more care and support that they need. Okay, so uh, I just want to, one of the things that you had mentioned, you know, they think they're a teacher, they think they're going to work, whatever it is. Do you, with the resource that you've talked about, do you provide counseling to the families on how they talk their person through this? Because there's so many instances, I've had so many instances, many people that are writing in, you have instances of your person, you know, they're waiting for their mother to show up, you know, their mother's passed many years or, you know, they're trying to go to work. How do you change that conversation with them or you don't? Do you just go along with it? What do you tell caregivers? That's exactly right. That therapeutic fib 
is what we talk about. And that may be very uncomfortable for us, but what's important is that you enter your loved one's reality. So when my father called me by my mother's name, I just answered. I didn't argue with him. If he told me that it was raining, it's raining. If he asked me the same question 20 times, I would answer it as if it were the first question. And what we talk with families about is to be able to move into a different environment. You know, just that connecting with your loved one, detecting what's going on, and just moving that conversation to just even a different room in your home. Mm -hmm. The family, it more or less allays, you know, that, that progression and that repetition, which may be very annoying to us as daughters, right? But it's not annoying to them because they don't recall that they just asked you that question. So our information and our education and our counseling with our families is not one time because we can't, you know, learn in one session, right? It's continuous. We continue to inform, we continue to educate, and it's, and it's very emotional and it's very uncomfortable for us, right? But certainly we don't want our loved ones to live through the, you know, the hurt or the loss of a loved one, for example. So if someone lost a sibling, they lost their parents, especially, you know, with anyone you're dealing with with Alzheimer's disease, if they start to say, gee, I haven't seen Michael in a long period of time, you know, you can say, gee, I haven't seen him either. Maybe I'll give him a call. Mm -hmm. Because why should I go through the fact that he's no longer with us, right? So, you know, it's a different way to think. It's a different way to behave. It's a different way to communicate. But there's so much that we could do to be helpful to that family at that moment. Okay. So, um, if caregivers need help in the home, are there services available? I, I know that there's paid services, but if you can't afford it, is there help for people to get a relief so that they can go out and take yes. care of themselves so that they're healthy for their loved ones? Yes. Yes. Uh, the respite program may be, um, which is available in every county. So the Alzheimer's Association connects with our community partners. There is a respite program coordinator. There is a Jersey assistance care coordinator that can work with families to talk about what their specific situation is and perhaps what services may be available to them. Uh, there are veterans benefits as well. So there are many different services that an ordinary um, individual who is not involved with Alzheimer's and dementia may not think about. And that's why we always say in the very beginning, when the diagnosis is Alzheimer's and dementia, learn more about what services and resources that you may be entitled to. And it varies. It varies by age, by economic status, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly there are many variables, but having people that they could talk to in the community, that's why at the Alzheimer's Association, our community partners are so important to us. To, uh, for me to be able to say, call the Morris County um, Sheriff's Department and speak to so-and-so, because that person is going to speak to you about different um, uh, project lifesaver um, ways in which your loved one can be safe or call so-and-so at, you know, um, the Jersey Assistance Care Coordinator Program in your county, call so-and-so at the Board of Social Services. Because if I can make that connection for them, perhaps I'll make that next call just a little bit easier. So if you don't know what your services are in your community, this is a nice time to say, I have a diagnosis, what's available in my county? And how can I reach out to all these resources? And what do I need to know? Not only um, from a social supports perspective, but also from a healthcare perspective, right? We always say to build out your care team. Okay. Um, okay, here's another one. How do we help a person in the early to mid stages of dementia retain their rights and decision making if their incapacity is mostly just memory? 
Well, we always talk with our families to have conversations with uh, certainly their healthcare provider team, but then also we want to make sure and the community resource finder portal that uh, is powered by the Alzheimer's Association as well as AARP has a listing of elder law attorneys, has a listing of financial advisors, and to have that conversation so that those conversations could be had with experts. That's why so many of our education programs wrap around not only medical care, but the social care, but also early care planning for individuals. So they know who to turn to, they know what resources are out there, and we certainly have information on our website at alz.org, which is a repository of different resources and information for caregivers. alz.org slash care has a number of resources that walks families through those conversations and how to best prepare for those conversations. Okay. Um, it might be helpful because we're all going through this pandemic um, to talk a little bit about the impact that the pandemic has had on um, our families, um, those that have been diagnosed and what's going on with that and how we can best help. Well, we talk about physical distance and how important that is, but it's that social distance that we're trying to close the gap on. The Alzheimer's Association from day one of, of our current situation has offered virtual education programs, virtual support groups. We wanna make sure that we connect also families with all of the resources that are available online and virtually. We wanna make sure that we connect families with the technology. There are community centers that actually have a borrowing program for their iPads so that families can see each other. We also, you know, talk a lot about the importance of seeing and speaking to their loved one so that they feel that they are, you know, sharing those experiences personally with their loved one. You know, certainly we know that this is such a trying time for our families. You know, certainly having been a caregiver for two very elderly parents that really spanned over 20 some odd years of my own life, I can say how difficult it was even then, you know, with other issues that we're certainly servicing, but certainly now to not be able to see their loved ones, we have to do our best to make sure that our communities, our, our systems of care are all understanding the importance of bringing their residents, their community members, their families to the uh, service and to um, experience time with their own loved ones. Because without that interaction, what happens? Communication skills atrophy, people don't have that love and care and support. And remember someone with Alzheimer's disease has a very strong need to be loved. The heart is the most important organ, right? To be able to see someone and feel the love and show the love is critically important. So we've been working very, very hard to be able to help our families and our communities connect. That's what's important to connect every day, connect. Okay, um, I wanna get to as many of these, these questions as possible. So we already have, a, have retained an elder care attorney. Some family members want to take over control rather than help retain the rights, dignity, decision-making of our mem family member. How do I help my mom have a voice? I am her 24 by seven caregiver and they want to control and decide for her without caring or listening to her wishes. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this one over. Uh, with regard to that, there should be a court appointed attorney that's overlooking everything that's going on. And if there's anything that's going on that you think is untoward, then you may want to bring it to that court appointed attorney for your mom and let them know so that they can further look into it if need be. And they can actually file something with the court and, uh, put a stop to it if it's if there really is uh, problematic behavior of any kind, because certainly the guardian is in place to take care of the individual, in this case your mom, 
They're not there to take advantage. They're not there to control. They're there for support. Thank you. Very true, very true. Thank you. And we always talk about person-centered approaches and how important it is in any setting, right? To make sure that we are including the person, right? On the journey, absolutely. Okay, we're about five minutes out. Um, I would like you to speak a little bit more about this memory cafe. Yes, thank you. We have memory cafes that we offer virtually so that families can come online with us. And we have people who are facilitating our memory cafes who are themselves in their early stages. And one in particular, this particular cafe that I'm thinking of, they meet monthly and they meet for an hour and a half. And it was really an answer to a call to mobilize our community to come together. And we not only have conversation about um, Alzheimer's and dementia, but more importantly, we do a lot of activities. We cook together online. We uh, certainly do gardening online. We're gonna be celebrating um, the Thanksgiving holiday actually next week where everyone's bringing and sharing their favorite recipes. And we laugh, we don't cry, we laugh. And we tell stories because story storytelling is so important to all of us because we all share. And when we laugh and we talk and we experience different activities together, then we all learn together. And then uh, certainly people are really feeling that, you know, we've reached them where they need to be reached. And across the country, we have memory cafes. Uh, certainly anyone interested can go online to our community resource finder portal. And because our programming is virtual, that means that anyone can join any program anywhere in the United States. And certainly communityresourcefinder.org or alz.org slash community resource finder or CRF, alz.org slash CRF is an important resource so we can find where all those programs are. We have library programs. In fact, we have um, not met, unfortunately, because of the pandemic at the Roxbury Library, but uh, we have a, a book club that we started there, actually with a woman in her 50s who wanted to meet other women just like her. She loves to read. She wants to talk about, you know, the books that we choose. So we read together online. We have another program that's a social engagement program that also takes place in the library, but of course, everything is virtual where we experience the world together, right? What a better place to be able to learn and experience and share. So, you know, we help our caregivers and our families, but person-centered care, and providing care and support for our families with our person living with Alzheimer's is so important, so important. And Robin, you know, one of our goals today is just to raise awareness. And I know you have a lot of volunteer opportunities that some of the participants here might be interested. So why don't you take a minute and talk about that before we turn it back over to the surrogate? Yes, absolutely. ALZ.org slash NJWalk is an opportunity, our walks to end Alzheimer's country in New Jersey, and certainly all over the country, we are now walking virtually. So we invite our families to be able to go online, to register alz.org slash njwalk, and to be able to register themselves or the community members and walk to raise awareness. We need volunteers to help us with um, certainly bringing awareness into our communities. As we know, all of our programs and services are free. Programs and services ourselves, we have volunteer.alz.org, where all of our volunteers can be educated, informed, trained, coached, and mentored as a programs and services volunteer to deliver community education, to deliver um, certainly support groups, and we have opportunities in advocacy. We're always looking for individuals that will raise their voice for those that cannot. Uh, and certainly at the state level and, and, at the, um, and at the federal level. What's most important is that we have so many activities because we offer all of our services that are free. We want our communities to get involved. The more people that know about the Alzheimer's Association through ALZ.org, 
uh, it, it's important for all of us to be able to know the plethora of resources and services that we provide. So I invite anyone to go online to alz.org as well as alz.org slash nj and see all of our services, our programming and become a voice for all of our families because we don't know, we may be you know, on the journey ourselves at some point in our lives. And we want to make sure that uh, we just um, mobilize our community and encourage all of our community members to be part of the solution. It's all about finding solutions. Okay, thank you, Robin. And with that, thank being you. Said, I'm gonna turn this back over to our surrogate, Heather Darling. Uh, Robin and, and Christina, you briefly talked about isolation, and I think it's important that we highlight that as we exit this, because what we've been dealing with with these COVID lockdowns and the, and the fact that we're now re-encountering this uh, resurgence and we're revisiting potential lockdowns, especially here in New Jersey, the impact of this, this lockdown for all of us is to bring us inside of our minds, because when things get quiet around us, when we're isolated, we tend to go inside of our own minds. And when you have a disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or even a mental illness where your mind it itself has a, a disease or a defect in it, and now you're focused in there. It's got to be exceedingly difficult. So, Robin, I, I thank you and the Alzheimer's Association of Greater New Jersey for everything that you're doing to give resources to help people. Because even in this short amount of time that we've been experiencing this, it's it's been less than a year, but it's so traumatic. And we've seen statistics showing the tremendous impact on, on suicides and mental health issues and other things that have occurred as a result of the lockdowns. So, you know, for anybody out there who's who's dealing with what's going on, I really hope that today's been informative for you beyond uh, or in addition to those that we really plan the Alzheimer's the suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia for this program to educate, but also to to bring help to maybe others that are experiencing additional issues just because of, of lockdowns that have been imposed. And uh, I, I hope that this will be the beginning of an ongoing discussion of these issues and how we can help caregivers and help families to get through this. So today's session, like the others, will be available on the website at morrissurrogate.com next week. If you have more questions on this topic, you can contact the Alzheimer's Association of Greater New Jersey at alc.org. As always, if you have additional questions, you can contact me at surrogate at co.morris.nj.us. Robin, I want to thank you for providing us with some great information. You're obviously an expert and a wealth of knowledge in this subject. We appreciate your time today. Christina, thank you again for hosting. As always, you've been a wonderful hostess. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in for today's session. We hope to see you again next month for some more great information. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, surrogate.